I know you're all fascinated by mysteries like me. It's something that really drives me. I'm, I'm somebody who's just obsessed with mysteries. As soon as I hear a mystery, I try to figure it out and figure out what it means. As a child, I really became intrigued by one particular mystery. And I mean, as a small child, I had a mother who was interested in this type of mysteries as well. And she introduced me to something that I have believed today to be uh, the greatest archeological mystery of our time. And I really believe that this is the greatest archeological mystery. And I'm sure you're all familiar with it, but I just wanna go over it fairly quickly. Let's see if this thing is gonna work. No. Is that the button? No. Okay, no, that's not it. Yeah, but that wasn't the next slide. <laughs> Let's see here. Maybe if I touch that one. Okay, yeah, boom, got it. This thing doesn't work. All right. I call it the greatest archaeological mystery of our time. It started in the 1800s when the Victorian era archaeologists began uncovering something strange in the ruins of the New World civilizations they were digging up. They noticed that cultures like the Maya and Aztecs in Mexico and the Inca and pre-Inca cultures of Peru, of which there are numerous, shared profound parallels. Um, they, they had, uh, uh, the parallels were with the cultures like the Egyptians in the Old World and the Babylonians and Persians in the Old World. They noticed that they had the same art, the same architecture, the same symbolism, the same iconography. And so, for example, ancient cultures, as we know across the world, didn't just build pyramids, they built stepped pyramids. And a lot of the times they built pyramids without a top. They're called truncated pyramids. And beside that, they realized that uh, all around the world, uh, there was mummification, both in the old world and new world, the two hemispheres across the Atlantic. Not only that, but they noticed that the mummies were given gold masks on their faces. And that's an interesting detail that was also the same. Instead of uh, alphabets, they wrote in strange pictures that were called hieroglyphs. They're called hieroglyphs in the new world and the old world as well. And they also used the same corbel vault arches. They're called corbel vault arches. Uh, and they used these in their temples. And so exactly what meaning it had, they weren't sure, but they believed that uh, there was something special there. Uh, there's a lot more parallels, but just to throw one more at you, and I know you've seen this one before, they all had the same elongated skull tradition. So the Victorian era archaeologists wondered, you know, how is this possible across the Atlantic Ocean thousands of years before Columbus? And so they theorized that there must have been a mother culture, uh, a parent source back to which these parallels can be traced. Um, they called it sort of an advanced civilization, and they believed it was so old that it had been forgotten by history. They identified this mother culture with the legendary Atlantis, and the Greeks talked about how the uh, Atlantis existed in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. As the story goes, the, uh, the, the continent or the city of Atlantis fell beneath the waves, but survivors fled, forming new civilizations on both sides of the oceans. For many Victorians, this theory of Atlantis that sank beneath the sea and survivors fled to both parts of the world neatly explained the parallels that they were finding. So when I was uh, around college age, I really started, this, this really started to sink into me and I felt like this was a great and interesting topic to pursue for a few years. Uh, I was actually interested in Egyptology and I wanted to pursue a career in Egyptology. So I started asking my professors and asking archeologists and attending lectures and conferences. But I learned something very important. <clears throat> they all frowned on what I was interested in. They didn't really care about any of the parallels. They were very almost upset when I would bring them up at a conference and whatever I seemed to mention it, everybody kind of looked at me like, go away. And that kind of made me feel like I had to do something because I knew, I, I truly believed there was something there. And so I figured, you know, maybe it's that we haven't really found the kind of smoking gun. Maybe we haven't found enough evidence to show what I believe was a probable connection between these, this old world and this new world. So the year was uh, 1995, I was 23 years old. I was just graduating from college and I decided to travel. 
And so I got a job and I saved some money and I went to different parts of the world and I went to really good places. And one of the places I went to was Egypt and I'd stayed for quite a while. This photo is really special for me because it reminds me of a great time in my life when I was discovering a lot of different things and realizing who I was as a person. And so I, while I was away, I spoke with scholars, I spoke with Egyptologists, museum curators, people at the archaeological sites, people who, uh, who grew up around there, uh, guides at the sites. And within a few years, I started to recognize new parallels that the past Victorian scholars hadn't recognized before. And I started to recognize one parallel in particular that really just grabbed me. It just grabbed a hold of me like nothing else in my life. And you can see it here. Um, I found an architectural parallel common to every single ancient culture. And I started to call it a triptych temple. Triptych is a word that was used by the Renaissance uh, artists in order to explain a certain type of painting where the middle piece of the painting is larger than the two smaller pieces of the painting on either side. Now, notice here in, this, in these images how the door in the middle is slightly larger than the two doors flanking it on either side. I first noticed these triptych temples among the pyramid building civilizations, which as we know are the world's oldest cultures. But triptych temples are visible in the ruins of practically every ancient culture. And the thing that really got me was when I started to show people this, they said, well, that's just a coincidence. And I said, no, because I've really looked into this and I noticed that they occur multiple times in each culture. And here's an example. Um, this is a collage of triptych temples that I found built by the ancient Maya culture of Mexico. And as you can see, it's not just one, it's several of them. And this is just a small handful. I could put uh, probably about 30 or 40 more triptych temples built by the Maya that I know about on the screen. So I started to really realize that something uh, big was behind this three in one door temple or three door temple. Um, I intensified my study of ancient religions and spiritual traditions. And I started to realize that the triptych is not just a random visual similarity. Ancient peoples everywhere built the same triptych temples to symbolize and to celebrate the same, what I started to call, universal religion. I began to call this teaching, uh, this universal religion, as a kind of perennial philosophy or as a kind of uh, a wisdom tradition. And slowly I started to understand the universal religion. It's a self-empowering spiritual doctrine. And as we'll see today, it's based on the number three, matching up to the three doors of the triptych. In a nutshell, just a quick idea here, the universal religion of the triptych temple teaches what in Latin is called the coincidentia oppositorum. And that means the union of opposites or harmony of opposites. This idea, I would start to realize, forms the foundation of every ancient civilization, bar none. On the left, describing the Maya religion, I don't know if you could see from back there, but the Mesoamerican scholar Mercedes de la Garza wrote, the basic concept of the Mayan religion is that, and that of Mesoamerica in general, is the harmony of opposites. That's a profound statement. He's labeling what I found as the triptych as the actual basis of all of Mesoamerican and Mayan religion. In the middle, describing the Egyptian worldview, the Dutch Egyptologist Henri Frankfurt said the same thing. He said, the deeply rooted Egyptian tendency to understand the world is as a series of pairs of contrasts balanced in unchanging equilibrium. That's the same thing. It's the same exact concept, the balance of the opposites. And on the right regarding Asia, the Hindu scholar Stephen Rosen said, the ability to see the harmony is nowhere more prominent than in Indian theology. Transcending of all pairs of opposites is central to Hindu thought. Central, that means there's nothing really more important than that. So this evidence shows that civilizations in ancient Africa, 
Asia and America were linked by the same, the very same balance of opposites idea, religion, concept, whatever you want to call it. So I, I, I really felt like I had something at this point. When I returned to New York City from my travels, I was still in my 20s, and I started to see triptych temples everywhere, but not in the ruins of ancient cultures. Now I was seeing them in more modern buildings, not in thousand-year-old buildings, but in hundred-year-old buildings. So I started to wonder, were these, are these modern triptychs in some way memorials to the ancient triptych temple that I had found. And I began to suspect that I wasn't the only person in the modern era to understand what the triptych temple was or to discover the triptych temple phenomenon or the universal religion that it symbolizes. I couldn't, though, find any books on it. I spoke to professors, archeologists, historians, and nobody had heard of it and nobody could tell me where I could find more information. So I continued looking for the triptych in architecture. And then one day I was in Manhattan in New York City. I was standing in front of Rockefeller Center, uh, which I think you're all familiar with. And I kind of had an aha moment in my life. I noticed that the building's facade had a massive triptych entrance. Its twin outer doors are decorated with male and female figures, while the center door depicts an ancient god or deity. Now think about this, a male on the right, a female on the left, and a god in the middle. This matched my research. I was starting to realize that the twin outer doors of the triptych symbolize the doors of opposites, and the center door symbolizes the unity of the two doors in balance. You know, when they say center yourself, you're off center, you're on one side. Don't go to one side, don't go to the other. Stay balanced in the center. And that's where I started to feel like this was all about. So if you look closely now at the God in the triptych center door, he's holding a compass. He's holding a gold compass. I didn't know it then, but in time I learned that the compass is one of the chief symbols of an age old fraternity of builders. It's called the Masonic Fraternity. I learned that the Freemasons have a history reputed to stem from antiquity, um, that the Brotherhood is not really a religious group, but more of a mystical order. I learned that Freemasonry contains allusions to a variety of ancient civilizations, not, not just one culture, but many different cultures. And in my mind, I thought, wow, that's a perfect storehouse for an, an ancient universal religion. I also learned that many famous men were Freemasons, but what struck me probably as, as the most important thing was that I realized that Freemasonry holds some sort of strange fascination with the number three. And uh, there's the Masonic uh, square and compass. It's very similar to the gold compass that's being held by the deity in the center door of the triptych. And here with the number three, we read in Masonic author Jeremiah Howe's book, in Freemasonry, the number three is the most important and universal in its application of all the mystic numbers, and we find it pervading our whole ritual. On top of this, I discovered that US government buildings convey triptych architecture, including, but not limited to, the US Capitol building in Washington, DC, which is arguably the most important building in the United States. As Freemasonry came to America from England, I found many British examples of the triptych also. Again, you can see we have the center door being a little bit, the triangle in the center is a little bit bigger than the two twin triangles flanking it. So I started to realize that there was something important that uh, Freemasonry had to do with the triptych. And I became fascinated by secret societies in general. Um, the Freemasons, the Skull and Bones, the Shriners, the Odd Fellows, the Knights of Pythias, and others. And I soon realized that the triptych is a common denominator that all of the secret societies share. It indicates to me that they were founded for a common purpose, namely to safeguard the universal religion of antiquity and to teach it to new initiates. And just to give you a quick uh, a preview here of some of the triptychs that I found, here are some Masonic lodges with a triptych 
on the facade. And as you can see, it's a, it's a purposeful triptych. It's a, it's a symbolic triptych. It didn't have to be there. It was put there purposely for a reason. Here are some Knights of Piteous Lodges, the Knights of Piteous being a secret society as well, like the Freemasons. Here are some Knights of Piteous Lodges with a triptych facades. And again, the same thing. It seems as though the triptych was put there on purpose for a reason to symbolize something. Here are some Shriner buildings with triptych facades. The Shriners were a, a spin-off organization of the Freemasons. And here are some Odd Fellows Lodges, again, the Odd Fellows and other secret society, Odd Fellows Lodges with triptych facades. And I don't know if you've heard of the Skull and Bones Secret Society at Yale University, but boom, right there, there's a, there's a triptych on the facade of the Skull and Bones headquarters at Yale University up in New Haven, Connecticut. No scholar has, like I said before, has ever noticed this triptych repetition. There's been no books about it, no lectures, no papers. But here's something interesting. Some artists have unconsciously picked up on it. Now, I don't know, do you guys have The Simpsons here? You do, right? Or no, I don't know. It's been a crazy few days and I haven't forgot to ask somebody, but the, uh, Matt Groening is the creator of The Simpsons, and in one episode, the fictional stonecutters are a parody of the Freemasons. And if you look at Groening's triptych, it forms the, the, uh, the headquarters here, as you can see. The center door is wider and taller than the two doors flanking it. Notice there's a giant eye in the middle door of the triptych. We're going to talk about that in a bit. But a lot of Masonic lodges also have that same exact pattern, that same triptych, even made with triangles. And the eye in the center is uh, prominent. The way it, you can see here, it's a little hard to see, but if you look closely, there's a giant eye inside that triangle. So when I was a kid, again, another one, what about the Flintstones? Did you guys have the Flintstones? Yeah, the Loyal Order of Dinosaurs, you know? Triptych Secret Society and the Flintstones. And the reason I think it was, people was, oh, you know, they knew, everybody knew. I, you know, I don't know about that. I think maybe as an artist, the artist had to, was tr tasked with drawing a secret society. And he probably looked at some buildings of, of secret societies. As, and as an artist, he probably recognized the pattern, didn't think much of it, but included it here. Um, so I was really enthralled by all this. I really felt like I was onto something very important. So I went down to, uh, I, I grew up in New York City. And I went down to visit the, uh, the uh, 23rd Street Masonic Temple. I expected to find these master occultists, master esoteric teachers, but instead, to my great surprise and to my great dismay, I learned that most Masons had very little interest in esoteric subjects. I soon realized that for the past 150 years, Freemasonry has been suffering from a kind of amnesia. Uh, the true wisdom of the fraternity seems to have disappeared from the, from the consciousness of its members. In their book, The Hiram Key, Freemasons Chris Knight and Robert Lomas say, a compelling reason for silence among Masons is not so much a fear of macabre retribution. It's more that they don't understand a word of the ceremonies they participate in. Our biggest criticism of Freemasonry is its sheer pointlessness. It doesn't know where it came from and no one knows what it's trying to achieve. According to the website of the Grand Lodge of England, the honest answer to the questions when, where, and why Freemasonry originated are that we simply don't know. And and so this is a challenge. Uh, you know, why don't the Freemasons understand their own origins? So this gave me kind of a, a new, newfound enthusiasm. Uh, one thing very quickly is that I learned from the, uh, from the Grand Lodge of England, I spoke to them and they said, the only thing that we can tell you is that we believe that Freemasonry has arisen from the cathedral builders of medieval times. And so that really sparked my interest. And I kind of, uh, with newfound enthusiasm, I went to Europe and I started to study the cathedrals, and, and right away I noticed that they were all packed with incredible symbolism, and symbolism that not necessarily Christian. Um, I found that uh, different symbols that we call pagan were written in stone upon them. 
But I started to notice something really important, and this is what really changed my life at this point. I started to notice a repeating architectural pattern, the same pattern over and over again on different cathedrals. And scholars have not recognized this pattern. I asked many, probably over a hundred of them, and nobody had heard of anything, could never point me into a book that showed me this pattern. And so I described this pattern in my 2011 book, Written in Stone, where I refer to it as the Cathedral Code. It's formed by the following three architectural features. First, two tall twin towers on top. Second, a giant rose window in the center. And third, a triptych three-door entrance on the bottom. And this same pattern repeats on literally hundreds and perhaps even thousands of Gothic cathedral facades in Europe. So why do we have the same uh, repeating pattern? Why? Uh, is it possible that there's a message encoded in this design? Is it possible? So I was traveling from cathedral to cathedral trying to figure it out. During my trip, I took a book, The Hunchback of Notre Dame, written by Victor Hugo, 1829. And in it, Hugo called architecture the handwriting of the human race. He also said something even more telling. He said, <coughs> Excuse me, from remotest antiquity, the human race has employed architecture as its chief means of writing. Sometimes an entrance, a front, or even an entire church presents a symbolic meaning wholly foreign to religion or even hostile to the church. Only the initiated can decipher these mysterious books. I was also reading a book called The Beautiful Necessity, written by in 1910 by an American author named Claude Bragdon. He wrote, in medieval Europe, fragments of the secret doctrine transmitted in the symbols and secrets of the cathedral builders determined much of Gothic architecture. In his, 18, in his 1989 book, The Occult Conspiracy, author Michael Howard agreed with this saying, it's generally believed in occult circles that these medieval masons had inherited esoteric knowledge from their pagan antecedents and that this knowledge was incorporated into the sacred architecture of the cathedrals. So I slowly became convinced as I was looking at these Gothic cathedrals that in fact, what they really are, are triptych temples or something akin to it. I also began to think that the entire Gothic cathedral facade surrounding the triptych, including the twin towers and the rose window, is a message in stone that reveals the triptych's true meaning. Of course, this would be heresy, and this would be considered a direct threat by the church. And so I started to learn that at some point in the 1700s, the church suddenly and inexplicably broke away from the Freemasons. The church did a 360 degree about face. And instead of commissioning the Freemasons to build more cathedrals, they suddenly sought to stop, stomp out and destroy Freemasonry forever. In the 1700s, Pope Leo XIII accused the Masons of practicing paganism. Imagine that, you had these builders of your churches for centuries, and then all of a sudden something happens and you accuse them of being pagans. He wrote, the purpose and aim of the Masonic sect, having been discovered from plain evidence, is easy to understand. To try to revive, after 18 centuries, the manners and institutions of paganism. We intend to turn our attention to the Masonic fraternity to illustrate more and more this wicked force and stop the spread of this contagious disease. Wow, that's big. Something big happened. What did they find? So we can find the answers to what they found, I believe, by decoding the uh, Gothic cathedral architecture. And in order to do that, we need a key. And I think I found the key. The key is what's called a tracing board. And it's present in every Masonic lodge around the world. The tracing board, in my opinion, is a blueprint of the Gothic cathedral facade. It's a blueprint of the cathedral code. It might not look like a, a blueprint to you, but that's exactly what it is. Look at the twin pillars on the tracing board. Masons call these the Jacob and Boaz pillars. These are the cathedral's twin towers, I believe. 
Writing in the early 1900s, other authors believed it as well, including Masonic author Walter Wilmshurst, who wrote, the twin pillars have been incorporated into Christian architecture. If you recall the construction of York Minster or Westminster Abbey, you'll recognize the pillars in the two great towers flanking the main entrance. Is this true? Are the twin pillars called by Freemasons Jacob and Boaz really encoded into all the twin pillars of cathedral architecture? If so, why? What exactly do the Jacob and Boaz pillars symbolize? Masons are told that they symbolize the, uh, that they once decorated the front entrance to King Solomon's temple in Jerusalem, but I believe that this is just a dead end story. It doesn't lead anywhere. It doesn't teach you anything. In truth, the Masonic twin pillars form what I believe are the very foundations of the ancient universal religion that I talked about. How? Well, look at the tracing board. Notice how the pillar on the right-hand side, which is called Jachin, is capped by the sun. And the left-hand pillar on the left side, obviously called Boaz, is capped by the moon. This duality of the sun and moon tell us something critically important. All the world's cultures perceive the sun and moon as perfect opposites, as I'm sure many of you know. In every culture, a swastika symbol was used to symbolize this idea. Every culture, same concept. A swastika has two S's. One S is a symbol of the sun, and the other S is a symbol of the moon. The sun and moon are perfect opposites according to a law in nature that we can all understand. The sun rules the day, the moon rules the night. The day brings light, the night brings dark. The light brings hot, the dark brings cold. The hot brings dry, the cold brings moist. The day symbolizes life, the night symbolizes death. Life is embraced as good, but death is feared as evil. Now, this is a naturally occurring pairs of opposites that are happening here. And by this chain of associations, the sun and moon engender and denote all the pairs of opposites in our world, in our universe. Now, here's something interesting. The sun and moon shine on average 12 hours out of 24 each daily. That's half each. That's exactly half each, right? And here's something that I, that honestly, it changed my life, this next little bit of information. When viewed from Earth, the sun and full moon appear to be identically sized in our sky, as if these twin heavenly uh, bodies are perfect opposites. The sun is much bigger, obviously, but the moon is much closer. So when viewed from Earth, they're the exact same size. So if you put this all together, this is a, not a marvelous coincidence, the way astronomers say, but really what it is, it's evidence of the mystical nature, in my opinion, the mystical nature of human existence. Ancient Chinese philosophers knew this well. Their Taijitu symbol, sorry, their Taijitu symbol, which we call the yin yang, depicts the sun and full moon together in one circle. The yin or full moon covers half the circle, the yang or sun covers the other half. And now think of this in terms of the tracing board. The sun crowns the Jachin pillar, that's Yang. The moon crowns the Boaz pillar, that's Yin. Thus, the Jachin and Boaz pillars of Freemasonry, like the yin-yang symbol, stand for the doctrine of duality, the pairs of opposites. And this is something that Wilmshurst, the author I quoted before, also knew. He said, many centuries before our Bible was written, the two pillars were used in temples. They stand for what is known as the pairs of opposites. Everything in nature is dual, and can only be known in contrast with its opposite. And here's a quote from an interesting author named Warren Kenton, whose work is often cited by Prince Charles. He said, erected by the Masons, the west front of each church had two towers representing the twin columns, the masculine and feminine aspects flowing down from heaven, called in Charles Cathedral, the sun and moon towers. Now this is interesting because here, Kenton points out something that's a little bit more tangible for us to look at. We have the two towers on Charles Cathedral. The right-hand tower is capped by an image of the sun and the left-hand by an image of the moon. And this is 
referring to what uh, Kenton calls, quote, the masculine and feminine aspects. That's because man and woman, like every other pair of opposite, is encapsulated by this doctrine. We're told by the early 20th century author Claude Bragdon, man, like the sun, is lord of the day. Woman is subject to the lunar rhythm. The Masonic guilds of the Middle Ages were custodians of the esoteric. The north or right-hand tower, the man's side, was called the sacred male pillar, Jachin. And the south or left-hand tower, the woman's side, the sacred female pillar, Boaz. And we see this on the Grand Master Certificate of the 16th century heretic, Giordano Bruno, who was burned at the stake in the year 1600 for heresy. We have a, a male pillar crowned by the sun on the right side facing us, and a female pillar crowned by the moon on the left side facing us. Again, this matches the twin towers of Gothic cathedrals. But why is the pair of opposites teaching so important? Why is it important that we have duality? What, what does it exactly mean? What does this wisdom mean to you and me? And the answer is, we live inside the universe, not separated from it. Thus, we too are formed by opposites. Our bodies are made from the same pairs of opposites as the universe, the light and the dark, the good and the evil, the right and the wrong, etc. Shakespeare said, our life is a mingled yarn, good and evil together. And the ancients believed this wholeheartedly. They believed the right side of our body was male and solar, and the left side was female and lunar. And again, Claude Bragdon says, though essentially a unit, there's a well-marked division into right and left. We have two arms, two legs, two ears, two eyes. Moreover, the terms of such pairs are masculine and feminine with respect to each other, one being active and the other passive. So no human, of course, is completely one gender or the other. Despite our physical characteristics, we all possess both masculine and feminine. <clears throat> Manly Hall was a, a Masonic author, and he noticed this, and he said, in ancient times, men fought with their right arms and they defended with their left arms. The right side of the body was considered masculine and the left side feminine. So this portrait appeared in an esoteric manuscript in the 1400s. It's a two-headed human, a male on the right holding the sun and a female on the left holding the moon. This is an esoteric portrait of you. It reveals the true makeup of a human being, half male, half female, and this explains the uh, angel on our right shoulder telling us to do good and the demon on our left shoulder telling us to do evil. And that's something that uh, we find in a lot of different cultures till today. Um, there's good and evil in the world and that means there's good and evil in all of us. Now, here's the question. Is that our fate? To be ruled by yin and yang? To be, to be tossed about left and right? To be so off balance that we don't know who we are and we can't find our center? No. The answer that the ancient philosopher said was no. And we can transcend this duality. How do we do that? Well, we do that according to the Freemasons and according to the people who preserved this ancient wisdom. We do that using the Masonic number three. And remember I said before, three is the key number in Freemasonry. The Masonic three teaches that we're more than just the twin opposing halves of an animal body. There's a, these twin halves don't constitute the whole human being, only the physical part, the material part, the part that lives and dies on earth. The Masonic Three teaches that deep down there's a spiritual part. And this third part, this spiritual part, encompasses both sides of the duality. And it can be found only through the union of the twin opposing halves. And this is, again, what I said before, the Latin term, coincidentia oppositorum, or the pairs of opposites, the balance point of the opposites, as I mentioned before. And I'll explain now the, how the ancients knew this. They knew it because you could see it in their symbols. Look at the Taijitu. You have yin and yang, and they represent the physical sides of the human body. But now look, yin and yang are both encapsulated inside of a giant circle. Okay, a lot of people miss that circle. They just see, oh, it's yin and yang. Yeah, but what about the, the third part? The most important part of this is the circle. The circle encompasses both yin and yang. 
And the circle symbolizes eternity because with no beginning and no end, a circle has always symbolized eternity to all ancient civilizations. The circle, according to Freemasons, is a symbol of your soul. It's called Tao in Chinese thought. And the circle is the part of you out of which all existence arises and inside of which the pairs of opposites live and move and have their being. The ancient Chinese philosopher Lao Tzu says, he who follows the Tao is one with the Tao. Being at one with the Tao is eternal. Though the body dies, the Tao will never pass away. The yin yang is in fact a three part symbol as I just was mentioning, it has three parts. It's made of twin dualities, yin and yang, with the circle being the third part, the Tao being the third part. Um, and this is the higher unity that yin and yang are encompassed in. And Lao Tzu tells us that as well. He says, the Chinese trinity, being the duality of yin and yang organized into a higher unity, is regarded as the source of all existence. And its symbol, the yin yang, possesses special significance for the Chinese thought, for the Chinese heart. And so this idea that a third force of unity ties together twin opposites is central in Freemasonry. We find it in Masonic thought and in Masonic architecture too. In Freemasonry though, its symbol is not a circle like it is in Taoism, encompassing the yin yang. In Freemasonry, its symbol is uh, the triangle. Um, the triangle that unites the twin pillars Jachin on one side and Boaz on the other. In precisely the same way, the circle unites yin and yang. And we could say that in another way, the triangle's apex transcends its two lower points, just as your soul transcends the two animal halves of your body. And this is because your soul is older than and higher than your body. Your soul is the source of your body. Think of the story of the Garden of Eden, the fall. We've fallen after eating from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. We've fallen down into the lower world of duality. We've fallen from our higher spiritual home in the heavens and we've landed in a world of opposites. And this concept is rampant in, in, the writer, in Masonic writers of the 19th and early 20th century, including John Yarker, who said, according to this mystic doctrine, all souls have pre-existence and have descended from the spiritual world into the earthly prison of the body. In other words, you're divine already. You existed before your body's birth and you'll survive your body's death. You're more than just a, phys <clears throat> a physical body. You're a soul and in authentic Freemasonry and in these teachings, in this hermetic wisdom, being a soul means being a God. A soul is a God, you are a God. A fallen God, but a God just the same. Having fallen, you are now in a sense imprisoned by the body which mimics the duality of the universe which your body temporarily lives in. And the esoteric scholar Alvin Boyd Kuhn said that. He said, man is a god in the body of an animal according to the pronouncement of ancient philosophy. He's absolutely right because the ancient philosophers talked about this. They all did. You find the same concepts that you find in Greek philosophy in Hinduism. You find it in Taoism. You find it in uh, religions essentially all over the world. Um, the famous 19th century essayist Ralph Waldo Emerson, who's one of my favorites, said, a man is a god in ruins. And the famous 19th century French poet, Alphonse de Lamartine said, limited in his nature, infinite in his desire, man is a fallen god who remembers heaven. I thought that was a profound quote when I first came across it. Man is fallen because in a sense, your body is not your true home. It's an imperfect and transitory vehicle. It's taught in ancient philosophy that your body imprisons your soul because think about it, your body has to be cared for. In order to survive, your body has to constantly breathe, eat, drink, maintain a constant temperature, fight disease. Even if your body can endure for decades, death will eventually destroy it. So for the ancients, your fall into a body was somewhat perceived as a tragedy. The 19th century author Olynthus Gregory wrote, the Platonists in general believed in a pre-existent state in which all souls had sinned and lost their wings. And so they sank into these bodies, partly as a punishment for former follies. 
It means you've descended so deeply into the material world that you've lost sight of your God self, of your spiritual self. You're so enwrapped in matter that you have amnesia of who you really are. And that's the God within you. So the important part of the Masonic teachings that really touched me the most was that despite all this, you can use the number three to sort of uh, take back who you really are, remember who you really are. And you do this by turning on the soul. Um, you know that your soul is being covered over by your body, but if you balance the opposites, if you transcend the opposites, you can actually find that center between them. And that's the third force. That's the coincidentia oppositorum. And you find this in, again, all the traditions, and especially in the magical traditions. We're told by Israel Regardi, who was a student of the magician Aleister Crowley, only in the reconciliation of opposing forces is the pathway made to true occult knowledge and practical power. In other words, <clears throat> you have to join your right and left sides. You have to join your male and female halves and you'll find what you're seeking. And this is what we're told in the aphorisms, aphorisms of Zosimos. When you join the opposites, a mystical awakening occurs. It involves our suddenly becoming aware of an organ and human faculty that we didn't know we really had. And we can see that hidden organ on this Masonic tracing board. It's very similar to the Masonic tracing board I showed you earlier. It depicts <clears throat> what seems to be an ancient pagan temple, and that's because it reveals an ancient pagan teaching. First, look at the twin pillars, Jachin and Boaz. They're aligned with the sun and moon directly above them. Now, look at the tops of the twin pillars. They both form the lower two halves of a triangle. Third, look at the apex of that triangle and notice the luminous eye directly above it. Why an eye? The answer is when you unite the opposites, you suddenly become illuminated, awakened. You suddenly become whole again. And when this happens, a mysterious hidden eye opens within you. Plato called it the eye of the soul, and the soul is who you really are. And we see this here in an old Masonic temple in Prague, Czechoslovakia. Many Freemasons believe incorrectly that this is the eye of the God of the Bible. But <clears throat> according to Plato, we, in every man there's an eye of the soul, which is far more precious than 10,000 bodily eyes, for by it alone is truth seen. <clears throat> the eye of the soul is naturally adapted to be resuscitated and excited by the mathematical discipline. <clears throat> Excuse me. Located in the center of our brains, Plato's eye of the soul has historically been called the divine's eye, the mind's eye, the cyclopean eye. And that's a whole nother lecture where we could talk about the cyclopean ruins. They're very advanced. They're very powerful. <clears throat> I, th <clears throat> I think it has something to do with the third eye. The real name of it is the third eye. And the awakened third eye endows its possessor with higher consciousness. And curiously, the third eye is not even mentioned in Western medicine. Our history books carry a very small description of it. They call it the pineal gland, and Webster's Dictionary uh, only has a couple of sentences devoted to it, calling it an appendage of the brain. It has the structure of an eye, and it's variously postulated to be a vestigial third eye, or even a, a seat of the soul. And there you have a remnant of the, of the teaching. They're calling it a seat of the soul. Uh, awakening the third eye is a custom in Asia to this day, in the Hindu religions, Buddhism. Here, the third eye is called Erna and Trinetra. It's marked by a dot on the forehead. It, it's called the Ajna Chakra. It's one of the seven chakras that are aligned in our spinal column, um, <clears throat> going from the pelvis to the top of the head. I'm sure you've all heard of them before. All the chakras are connected from the lowest to the highest through a central channel called the Sushumna. And two opposing channels, the Ida and Pingala, run to the left and right of the Sushumna. Negatively charged Ida is our left channel, that's the lunar and feminine channel. Positively charged Pingala is our right channel, that's our solar and masculine channel. And here you can see that the Ida and Pingala channels of Hinduism, of, of Kundalini Yoga, match up perfectly with the Jachin and Boaz columns and the yin and yang of Taoism. And so you're starting to see that they're all the same. It's teaching the same concepts everywhere. The art of Kundalini Yoga is personified on this ancient megalithic Hindu statue. It depicts a male on one side, a female on the other, both balanced in the middle by the god Shiva. And the awakened third eye is visible. The late 
Dr. Lee Sanella, who was the co-founder of the Kundalini Clinic in California, says that Kundalini is the real cause of all the so-called spiritual and psychic phenomena. The secret origin of all esoteric and occult doctrines, the master key to the unsolved mystery of creation, the inexhaustible source of philosophy, art, and science, and the fountainhead of all religious faiths, past, present, and future. And so during my studies, I came to believe that uh, Kundalini Yoga, this awakening of the third eye by balancing the Jaikin and Boaz, sun and moon, was the, uh, played a key role in, in the great work of all the secret societies, not just Freemasonry. And here are some images of what I believe is the awakened third eye on some odd fellows regalia. The Masonic triangle thus denotes more than just balancing life's dualities. It stands for the awakened third eye that occurs when life's dualities are balanced. And I wanna show you a cool quote from uh, Carl Jung. He says, unfortunately, our Western mind, lacking all culture in this respect, has never yet devised a concept or even a name for the union of opposites through the middle path, that most fundamental item of inward experience. It's at once the most individual fact and the most universal, the most legitimate fulfillment of the meaning of an individual's life. 1918, Dr. George Washington Carey, the all-seeing eye, this is the eye of Freemasonry, the third eye. While I'm credibly formed that few Masons understand their own symbols, the fact remains that they use them. And uh, let's return now to the Gothic cathedrals, and we'll be finishing the lecture right now with this. Uh, you can see if you follow the Twin Towers down, they end in what I call the doors of opposites. Um, a third larger door is centered between the doors of opposites. And this third larger door unites the doors of opposites into a kind of three-in-one symbol. Just as the apex of a triangle unites its two lower halves, and just as the circle unites the twins, yin and yang. So the triptych's center door thus signifies this center point, this balance of the two opposite sides uh, between them. And therefore, it represents the soul between us, uh, the soul within us in our center, and the God within us. Um, in this way, the entire triptych itself represents Carl Jung's union of opposites through the middle path. When we do this, when we unite the opposites, when we balance ourselves in our center, um, we awaken to a different path. We find our inner God. We find our inner peace. And I think that's what this triptych tradition uh, says all around the world. I've only just given you a very small piece of what I've found because of the uh, only 45 minute ability to tell you I don't want to go into every ancient culture and show proof of that. I do that in my book. Um, but the idea here is uh, we find the inner God in the middle between us, this God symbol on Rockefeller Center triptych, when we do balance these opposites. Now, very quickly, the, if you follow the middle door upward, you see the rose window. And the rose window is circular, okay? Remember we said the circle is always a symbol of eternity and the eternal soul. It's a perfect symbol of the, uh, the God within us and the soul within us between the twin towers of duality. And we have author Michael Rose who says in his book, uh, Ugliest Sin, the rose window is a representation of perfection, balance, and the harmony of the purified soul. Got a great quote here from Prince Charles who really has a lot of esoteric wisdom in him. And he says, the entrance into the building, he's talking about Charles Cathedral, which, is, uh, which I showed before. The entrance into the building is through a west front which comprises two soaring towers, one with a symbol of the moon upon it, one bearing the symbol of the sun, and beneath them sits one of the most spectacular of all rose windows, symbolizing the uniting of the apparent duality represented by the symbols of the sun and moon. When I read that, it was a kind of confirmation that I was reading these cathedrals correctly, and that really blew me away. The rose window is a descendant of Roman eye called the oculus. It actually stands for eye, uh, what Plato called the eye of the soul, because the rose window is both a symbol of the eye and the soul. And it's depicted just above the center door of the triptych. It's aligned perfectly in the center between the twin opposites. Um, so the last quote I'll show today is this one from the Hunchback of Notre Dame, where 
Victor Hugo likens that center rose window with the eye of a cyclops. He says, there's a certain about hour above all others when the facade of Notre Dame should be admired. It's the moment when the sun, already declining towards the west, looks the cathedral almost full in the face. Its rays growing more strongly while the central rose window flames like the eye of a cyclops. I think that's an esoteric reference right there. Um, in the US, we have something called the Ku Klux Klan. That's Ku Klux, the word circle, the circle clan. That evolved into a racist organization, but originally it was an esoteric, uh, an esoteric community. And um, if you think about a rose window, really what a rose window is, it's a circle with a, with a dot in the center. And that we know in, in symbology is a symbol of the self. Um, so tomorrow what I'll do is I'll present the conclusion of this lecture um, and we'll see how an eye symbol is depicted above the triptych center door. It's a common feature in Europe and in other parts of the world. It's not, unless you really, are, unless somebody points it out to you, like I'm doing here, it's hard to see. But here you can see this is the Bank of France. Um, and this building is from the late 1800s, I believe. It's a triptych, it's a three-in-one pattern, and there's a third awakened eye above the center door. And this is the whole concept of the triptych that we see in all the ancient civilizations. It means the same thing everywhere. Ida on one side, Tengala on the other, that's the Jaikin and Boaz, the Sushumna in the middle with the awakened third eye to uh, signify um, the higher self. This is a building in New York City that has the same three-door triptych, two-pillar Jaikin and Boaz. And if you look at the light coming from the third eye above the top, you could see a a parallel. So the information I presented here is just a small amount of the information I've gathered. There was a universal religion of antiquity. It was based on the balance of opposites. The main architectural symbol was the triptych temple and it was encoded in architecture by the Freemasons who I believe inherited this wisdom from their pagan antecedents. And that's it. We'll talk about more tomorrow in part two. Thanks everybody. I appreciate your listening.